welcome back, Shalligators, and welcome back, Levatics. Oh, yeah. Your girl's engagement is done. Not mine. Demi Lovato's. Just two short months, 60 measly days, after Max Eirik, her douchebag fiancé, proposed to her for reasons none of us could fathom, they have called it quits. We're going to break down what actually happened behind the scenes here because while sources are telling E! News, sources obviously being Demi herself to try to spin a positive narrative onto this, are trying to give some context to what happened and make Max look like the bad guy. Actually, if you read between the lines, Demi kind of looks like the crazy one. We're going to unpack what went on here, why maybe both of these people are mutually toxic and therefore it's a good thing that they called it off. But more than that, we're going to talk about love bombing. We're going to talk about what to do and what it means when someone is love bombing you, when they shower you with affection, because when that happens, there is an inevitable shift coming. Discardment and devaluation. We're going to go through the steps of this, how you can recognize it, and actually, maybe what to do if you're the love bomber. Ugh. Because it might be the case, the Demi was kind of at fault here. I'll break it all down. But before we do, be sure to follow me on Instagram. That's where you guys suggest this video topic. We voted. The other option was how to move on after a painful public breakup, Ugh. which we can also tackle in the future. There's going to be plenty of painful public breakups with celebrities. There's really no shortage of that. But we really wanted to focus on love bombing today, and I think it's absolutely the best topic. Also, follow me on Cameo. If you would like a video shout out for a friend, a birthday wish, a little pep talk for yourself, head on over there. I'm Shallon XO on Cameo. And be sure to follow me on Instream. It's our sort of sexy secret little clubhouse platform. It's ad free and uncensored, two bucks a month, where we do some really intimate story time, some sexy hookup tutorials. And coming up, I'm going to do a video on how to find a boyfriend on Tinder. Because I can tell you. Okay, Demi. <clears throat> So this is what a source has told E! Online. So yeah, Max Eirek, is that how you say his name? I don't care. He's a complete douche, right? We have talked about him at length and his thirsty, weird-ass tweets about other celebrities in Demi's sphere, sphere over like the past 10 years, like Ariana Grande, my wife, Selena Gomez, oh, I want to marry her, Miley Cyrus. It's clear that this dude is a clout chaser, right? And a clout chaser will eventually find someone who's buying his bullshit. And I don't think it's a coincidence that out of Demi, Selena, Ariana, and who is it? Miley, he landed arguably the messiest one. Demi has had a lot of problems. You know that I cannot stand Selena because she's just, anyway. But Demi has really been through it with the drug addiction, with the rehab stays, with the eating disorders. It can be said that she is the most vulnerable for a predator, right? We can kind of say this. I mean, I'm surprised Selena didn't take the bait, obviously. But that's the thing. Max Eirich is a predator. He's like a D-list soap star, like who even fucking cares, who is now suddenly shot to incredible amounts of fame thanks to Demi. And this, Demi says, could have spelled doom for their relationship. Let's hear what the quotes are. Oh, and by the way, yes, I'm back in California, back in the caftans. <laughs> Move this down. Back in the caftans. It's summer still in full swing here. It's like 92 today. I'm going to the pool wearing all my quarantine caftans. Because you remember during quarantine, I was stuck in California because I was on my way to Bali and all I had is like a billion caftans and bikinis. Anyway, according to a source, Demi, we talk all the time about how these sources are almost always the celebrity who is meant to look better in this story. Okay. The romance started going downhill in the weeks before Max traveled to Atlanta to film a new project. The source says they were arguing a lot and Demi didn't want him to go without her. I want you to remember that, okay? I want you to remember that sentence. There'd been a lot of tension because Demi did in fact follow him to Atlanta and then she left to clear her head. She didn't know who Max truly was and didn't think he had good intentions. There were many red flags she was ignoring and trying to turn a blind eye to. She doesn't trust him and thinks he's sketchy. She feels that he proposed to get attention. And he proposed in like, well, two months ago, I don't know. They only started dating in March. He proposed four months after that. And other sources had said that, you know, they were in this bubble of quarantine together. And Demi has said that, like, you know, we're in quarantine and everything's just so magical and everything's going well. We've also heard that with Khloe Kardashian and Tristan Thompson, trimester Thompson, that trick bitch, that, oh, in quarantine, everything's great. Do you know why? Because there's no one for him to cheat on, okay? 
if your relationship is only going well when every single factor or stressor or distraction that he is going to encounter all the time in daily life has been removed, your relationship is not going well. Your relationship is not going well. I have a new puppy, Cowboy. You can follow him on Insta, CowboyXO. And he is a handful. And if I were to say he's a great dog when I have him in a muzzle, in his kennel, blackout shades, I don't do these things. But like, if that's the only time he's a good dog, he's not a good dog. He is the best dog. All dogs are the best dogs. But you know what I mean? If he can't be around people and birds and sounds and sights and, and food, if he just wiles out and bites and scratch, then he's not a well-trained dog. Same with men. Same with men. Are men and dogs so different? No. They would both pee on you to mark their territory if you let them. Remember that. So I want us to come back to this one sentence. Demi didn't want him to go without her. We're going to come back to that. But for now, we're going to shift and we're going to talk about love bombing, right? Because we shalligators here are wise and wild women. And we, fuck, we saw this coming. I talked about this a lot. I called this, I saw this coming. Am I going to rub it in and gloat? Yes, I am. You don't like it? Unfollow. The point is, most of us could see this coming. Demi's inner circle obviously saw this coming. This is like a Pete Ariana thing. And Pete loved bomb, love bombed Ariana. I'm getting tattoos for you. I bought you a hundred thousand dollar ring. I'm bringing up my parents all the time. You know, in his weird fucking voice and his melon head. Eh. He was love bombing her. And I think the motivations were very different. Pete has borderline personality disorder and that, you know, obviously lends itself to a lot of love bombing. I don't think Max has borderline. Who knows? I don't know. He might. I think he is just a good, old-fashioned fucking social climber. It's a good old-fashioned douche. Doesn't always have to be a personality disorder. Doesn't always have to be a psychological thing underneath it. Could just be your run-of-the-mill dick. So let's talk about love bombing, right? This is something narcissists, psychopaths, sociopaths commonly employ. And I, again, I don't know if Max is any of these things. Who knows? He's got some very sketchy taste in genes. Is there correlation or causation? I do not know. Someone do a study. But love bombing is three parts. Idealization, devaluation, discardment. And this cycle is not just one time. This can be rinse, repeat. You can go through this cycle with a love bomber multiple times. And almost always you will, but not all the time. It is also important to note that love bombers, the vast majority of them, are men. But again, not always. And again, we're going to talk about what happens if maybe you're the love bomber. We'll get to that. Actually, I almost feel like I should save that for Evil Week. Oh, yes. Evil Week is coming. October 24th, seven days, seven sins. The best, evilest week of the year. So let's talk about who gets love bombed because that's the point, right? What can we do to avoid being an easy target for a love bomber? The number one thing that a victim has is a doubt of their self-worth. The semantics here are extremely important. Studies show that a victim, an easy good mark of a love bomber, is someone who doubts their self-worth. They doubt their own self-worth. Notice the studies and these conclusions and what I'm saying does not say they're a shitty person in the world agrees. They're just kind of a loser. Mm -mm -mm. They doubt themselves. An excellent target for a love bomber is someone very, like a very high powered woman, right? She feels lonely. She feels isolated. She feels like no one understands her. Why am I alone? I have all these fans, but I don't have any love. Why, why do I have all these fans and all this fame, but my parents don't talk to me and my sister hates me. Along comes a love bomber. They tap into that and you got a recipe for disaster. It is someone who doesn't believe in themselves, right? Someone who has an emotional wound. We also know that this is true because when you ask someone who has just extricated themselves from a love bomber, once you've been through it, the number one term that a victim uses to describe how they feel is drained. I just feel drained. You describe a love bomber as an emotional vampire. They take, they take, they take, they drain the life out of you. They took everything I had. They took my money. They took sex. They took all my friends. They took my self-esteem. Sometimes they take your health, they get you addicted to drugs, right? Drained. 
Why is that word significant? Because that tells me that that person was trying to be filled. You were drained. That's because you were trying to be filled. There was some hole inside of you that this love bomber very easily and quickly deduced, right? Like very easily honed in on and was like, oh, let me fill you up. And then I'm going to withhold that. That's the devaluation and then the discardment. I'm going to I'm fucking done with you. What a love bomber does, a big technique that they employ is being an excellent listener. And we're going to read from some from a, a doctor's article, this one doctor that I love that I, I always go back to and I always read his stuff, but we're going to get there in a minute. But one thing he says is that a love bomber will always be a good listener. Like, oh, just tell me everything. Yes, uh-huh. Do you know what they're doing? They're fucking data gathering. And I know, I hate to say this because we're like, should I date people who don't listen to me? No. You know what? Let's just, let's, let's skip ahead a little bit. Let's skip ahead. So Dr. Dale Archer, who I, like I said, I read his stuff a lot. I really like it. He writes very easy things to deduce. So I'm going to read from an article that he did about love bombing, right? And he talks about three early warning signs because he breaks it down just so super well. So here are three things that a love bomber might say to you. I know we've just met, but we are perfect together. Manipulative love bombers don't just walk up and say, we belong together. They have to give you evidence that it's true. That's why they target the vulnerable. Masquerading as good listeners, the bomber gathers intel on your likes, dislikes, insecurities, hopes, and dreams. Before you know it, they're saying you have so much in common, you must be soulmates. Another classic tactic, he didn't write this, but I just know this to be true, is that they overshare. This, they do an info dump. Oh, and then my grandmother cheated my grandfather and I lost my seat on Elon Musk's space shuttle. And just like they're pouring their guts out about all of their woes and trials and tribulations for a few different reasons. If they're very, very bad, they're trying to love bomb you so that they're putting a card on the table so that you put a card on the table. Meanwhile, these stories are telling don't really mean shit to them. They might not have much of a conscience. They are just, it, they're so rote and telling it they don't care. But you see this as this huge opening up. So you're going to be like, oh, and then this happened to me. But. Or a lot of times guys do that. They do that info dump to try to fuck you on the first day. What? Wait, what? Yes. Because then when he goes to make a move, what does a girl usually say? She says, no. She's like, we don't even know each other. And he'll be like, what do you mean we don't know each other? I told you about the engagement that I called off and the dog I had to put to sleep. I opened up to you and the girl is going to be like, oh my, oh my God. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Come up for a drink. I'm just, no, I just, you know, uh, and then they're in and then they're in. Beware the info dump. Beware the info dump. The first few dates, they're just peaks under the hood. And one thing Dr. Archer is sure to note is that when you're hearing these things, if they happen in the first six months, this is a very bad sign. And you're like, six months? Six months? All right, fine. You want to cut that in half? Let's say three months. It should not happen. You shouldn't hear any of these things. You shouldn't witness any of this love bombing behavior within three dates, three weeks, three months. If you're hearing these things right up front, that's a red flag. You can get to these places. We belong together. You're my soulmate. I love you. But it's about pacing. It's about time. And if things go too fast, it's a red flag. They're trying to rush you through the paces to get control over you ASAP and to bomb you, just to carpet bomb you so that you don't know which way is up. Or like I said, they're trying to fuck you ASAP. Which of these scenarios do you want to be in? Neither. Let's go back to what Dr. Archer says. A good litmus test is to think of your best friend and how much you have in common and how often the two of you agree or disagree. Now consider how long it took you to build that bond. This is really good, right? How likely is it someone you just met knows you as well as your best friend? If you find yourself saying, yes, they do, warning bells should be ringing. Red flag statement number two. Our future's so bright, we gotta wear shades. Dr. Archer is obviously like a boomer and he's referencing songs we don't know. He's like, what does that mean? It's some song from the 80s. Love bombers aren't just confident you belong together for all time. They describe the future in detail as if it's a Hollywood screenplay. They use phrases like, we're going to be so happy together. Someday, when I take you to Europe, I can't wait for you to meet my parents. Notice how all these statements are foregone conclusions and not questions. Love bombers don't ask. They declare how things will be with conviction. They don't sound crazy because chances are you've already shared your hopes and dreams. Ah, the info dump. While they were being such good listeners. 
All they have to do is to pretend to be the hero who will make those hopes and dreams come true. This is how the love bomber tricks you into thinking he is indispensable to your future happiness. I think, I love this one sentence. All they have to do is pretend to be the hero. Each fairy tale has a hero who has to have different things, right? And when we go on a bleh, an info dump and here's my hopes and here's my dreams and I, my parents didn't do this and my father, whatever. We are teaching them how to treat us in a negative way. We're teaching them how to script themselves in order to play this part that's going to gain maximum control over us. How do we avoid this? We shut the fuck up a little bit. Have we tried that? Have we tried shutting the fuck up? I used to just bleh, I used to be the classic info dumper. Here's everything about my life, everything about my career, everything about my history, everyone else blah, 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 blah. I was just this walking, talking, shallow luster Wikipedia page. And to the surprise of few, I got involved with absolute wieners. Either I looked completely crazy and over the top and quality guys didn't want to be with me because they're like, what is she dumping all this out for? I didn't know. I, I was completely crazy. Or toxic guys are like, excellent. A quality guy is going to run from that behavior if we do it, right? A toxic guy is just going to plug right in. He's like, oh. <laughs> she has laid out exactly a blueprint for how to manipulate her. This is too easy. Why would I leave? I'll leave eventually, but I'm not going to leave right now. You know what changed? I got into some therapy. Oh, I got into some goddamn therapy. I talked to people who were appropriate at appropriate times in an appropriate way to really get to the root of why I was still hung up on that ex, why I had issues with my family, whatever, whatever it was that I was dumping out, how I felt about my career and my this, I was speaking about it in a, in a useful problem solving way. Problem solving. Hmm. Problem solving. Why is that a significant thing? We're very caught up in semantics today in this video, right? The words we're using are, are for a reason. Problem solving, because heretofore, I didn't want to solve those problems. I wanted to be a victim. Ugh. I wanted to bitch and complain about the guy that broke my heart, the boss that wasn't fair to me, what happened here. Blah. I wanted to be a victim. It gave me something to say, it gave me something to talk about. What I thought was glittering, exciting stories, they were actually victim narratives that made me look, like I said, weak, easy prey, or insane to quality people. And when I finally took a step back and I was like, you are the common denominator in all of your relationships. When I finally did lose a quality guy and I really had to look at my behavior and I was like, fuck, I would have left me too. I would have left me too. What a mess. <sighs> then I'm like, okay, let's stop telling victim stories. Let's start telling champion stories. Not in a braggy way, I get braggy. But let's, if we don't even have anything to say on a date, that's fine. We don't need to launch into a victim narrative. We don't need to open up just to make a bond. And I would do that. That was another reason I would do it because I was desperate to have a boyfriend. So I was opening up, hoping this would att attract someone to me, attach someone to me and we would bond. And it did. And it was the love bombers. It was the toxic people, right? It wasn't the quality people. Like I said, quality dudes, healthy dudes who are doing that emotional cognitive work on their own, they don't want to be around someone like me acting like that. That seems like, ugh. it's like if you've worked hard to get sober and you're healthy, do you want to go hang out with drug addicts? No. You're like, I, I, this is not fun for me. And it was only when I took a look at that, that I became invincible to love bombers. Now that I am healthy, that I'm not trying to get filled up, I don't get drained. I look at someone love bombing me. I'm like, this is far enough. I put up parameters in my life to prevent love bombers. I don't follow people I date on social media. And if I do, like the guy I'm dating, he's like, did you get my DM? I was like, bro, I get thousands. I don't read your DMs. You want to talk to me? You can fucking text me. He's like, you're right. I'm, I'm so sorry. I was like, you don't need to be hitting me up on every single network. And conversely, because he's a healthy person, I was like, wait, you're on Snap. Should we follow each other? He's like, no, why would we follow each other on Snap? I don't want to like Snapchat my girlfriend all day. I want you to text me and talk. Like Snap is for like the others. Text and talk is for the priority people. I'm like, good, yes, that's exactly the right answer, right? We set up parameters in our life for space to keep people at a healthy, not a distance, but a balance, to keep people at a balance. I no longer cancel plans with my friends to see a guy. 
I don't even answer. If they call at 10 p.m., you, what are you doing? Fuck, not you. Goodbye, wiener. I keep my life rigid, but in a healthy way. In a healthy way to repel people who are trying to get in. What do we say about boundaries? What do we say about boundaries? The people who hate your boundaries are the people who benefited from you having none at all. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Phrase number three. You're so perfect, you deserve the best of everything. To manipulate you into thinking you found your soulmate, the love bomber builds you up as an idealized object. They constantly point out all the good traits you possess, minimize the bad, minimize the bad. Everyone else is at fault, not you. Mention that you've gained a few pounds, the love bomber will say how much healthier you look with a little extra rate. Did your husband leave you for a younger woman? The reply will be that he's blind, he's stupid, he's crazy. You're the most beautiful woman alive. Complaining about the boss who doesn't give out compliments, the love bomber will say she's an idiot for not recognizing your talent. Okay, wait. These are traits you want in a partner. I want to get fat and have my boyfriend be like, I love you anyway. Your boss is stupid. Your husband's dumb. Whatever it is. But it's about timing, right? Remember, it's about timing. This should happen, but not date three. Not week three, not month three, okay? This is something that is built up over time. Key. The love bomber is there to give you the self-image you wish you had, but lack. In fact, they'll put, they'll make putting you on a pedestal around the clock project. Text sessions that last for hours, depriving you of sleep. Flowers sent to work with notes extolling your virtues, surprise visits, trips, gifts, all with the same message. You deserve nothing less. And you know what, bitch, you don't. You do deserve that, but it's about pacing. It's about pacing. If you fear you may be in the early phase of a love bombing attack, picture that you're at a railroad crossing with a locomotive barreling down the tracks. The warning signs there is the warning sign there is true here as well. Stop, look, listen. Stop. Slow things down. Have a talk and say, hey, I really love everything about you, but let's slow things down a bit. It's moving too fast. I'm a little bit scared of that. Boundaries, right? If we say, hey, like, I love hanging out with you, but I cannot miss hockey practice one more time. Like, I, I love, like, us going out and getting drunk, but I'm hungover and I can't do my podcast, so we can't do that anymore. And I've said this to guys in the past, and the love bombers are like, what? What? They hate my boundaries. Remember the P- Paris Hilton documentary where her douche, like, wannabe ugh, clout chaser boyfriend, he's like, you said you would not do these interviews for me. You say you love me, but then you have and you go work. And she's like, baby, I have to work. No, no, you not love me. You can't do this and say you love me. Classic, classic love bomber thing. This is part of the devaluation phase. They build you up. And then if you have the audacity to say, I need two hours to do my laundry. I just want to sit and watch like a British soap drama. Like I need a night to myself. I want to see my friends. Things that are normal and neutral and healthy, they interpret as betrayal. And they will tell you that. You're betraying me. You go and do your work and then you leave. And I have to sit here in this beautiful suite with everything I want. Well, you go and make the money that pays for it. Fuck you, Paris. Right? What is normal is interpreted as betrayal. They devalue you. Let's keep going. Stop, look, and listen. Look, actions speak louder than words. If his words and actions are not in sync, that's a big red flag. I love how you work hard and you're such business woman. But wait, why you go and do the business as a woman? Why are you doing business and working? The fuck, how do those two things make sense? Listen, listen carefully to what he says. And don't be afraid to challenge the assertions. If he says, we will be perfect together, reply, well, it's early, but so far so good. You don't need to say, yeah, I know. We are conditioned to have a beggar's mentality. We are conditioned that any guy who wants us, who the fuck are we to say no? I don't, that's, this is moving too fast. You are not a beggar. You are a wealthy, wise woman. And I want you to look at people and be like, "Mm, I bet you do want to partner with me, obviously. But you know, we'll see how this goes. I'm still reading data points and logging them. I'm still evaluating how I feel. I'm still learning about you. You're still learning about me. Let's not make any sweeping declarations yet, right? Hey, it's going really well. If it keeps going the way it's going, this is a great relationship. But you know what? We're all open to things. And this is the thing. That shouldn't even be a conversation that comes up, right? If you're in a good place with someone, they shouldn't even make these statements to the point that you have to make contrary statements. 
it just should be flowing. So we've talked about the stages. Idealization, you're the best, I love you, businesswoman. Devaluation, how dare you leave and go do your laundry? How dare you go do your work? Then there's also discardment. But actually, hold on, hold on. I want to stay in devaluation for a little bit because I want to go back to Demi Lovato and what she said. Demi didn't want Max to go to Atlanta without her. I read that and I was like, oh boy. What if, what if, what if we've had this whole thing backwards? What if this whole time Demi was the love bomber? Yes, Max seems like a cloudy douche for sure. But what if it was Demi, the rich one, the powerful one, the influential one, who showered Max with everything? New clothes, she probably bought him a car, like move into my place. Oh, you're not working during quarantine. I'll pay your bills. I'll pay around. I can kind of picture that. Sometimes we're the love bombers, right? That happens for two reasons. Desperation and we don't know ourselves, which kind of comes back to desperation. When we love bomb someone, we just need someone in our life. We're casting for the role of boyfriend, right? Please love me. Please stay. I need you. I am empty. I need to be filled. I do not want to be drained. So if you're a woman with power, you can love bombs. Oh my God, we're going to be so happy. Oh my gosh. Yes, I bought us first class tickets. Eee, we're going away for the weekend. Yes, I had your car details. Ah! If you're a rich and powerful woman like Demi is like a lot of these celebrity women, you can shower people with things. I've done it. I mean, I do okay for myself. I can, I have a lot of things I can give to boys, right? I have a lot of influence. I have a lot of power, you know, just in certain, whatever. There's been a lot of things that I could have done for boys and I am a lover and I'm a giver and I just want to like, bleh, like just spew out everything I have to the people I love, family, friends, and of course, boys. And maybe it was some desperation because when I think about the boys I would do these things for, like these over the top gestures and I don't know, maybe it was love bombing. It was because I was so twisted about them. Like I was so in love with them, I needed them. They were a hurt locker though. I wasn't actually in love with them. I was in love with the idea of them. And I just needed them to stay in my life because they were fixing something. They were representing something. They were distracting me from something. I just could not let them go, right? So that's that can happen with love bombing. And then if you're also the love bomber, the devaluation comes when maybe, okay, you get him and maybe he's like, not that great. You get your hurt locker and you're like, this didn't fix everything. You're actually kind of a dick. Or we just don't have anything in common. Maybe you're not a dick. Maybe we just don't have anything in common. Or maybe you get the ick. Ugh. I am notorious for getting the ick. I get the ick all the time. I chase, chase, chase a guy. Not like chase it, but like I'm into it, into it, into it. And then like I get, like I get f my fill of him. And then I'm like, oh God, get out of my house. Get out of my bed. Get out of my laundry room. Get out of my house. I just get so sick of them. And then they might see that as devaluation, you know, because when we get the ick, we get, we get snippy right? Because we don't understand why we have it. It's like, I wanted to fuck you three nights ago and now I don't want you touching me with any part of your body. I don't even want you on my couch. You can sit on the chaise. Don't sit over here. And you're like, what is happening? We're not in touch with maybe what was going on, why we were so into it. Maybe it was the hurt locker, the emotional getaway car. And that shifted. We've got maybe become disgusted with ourselves. We've had a little bit of clarity that we're not willing to admit. Ugh. And things have changed. And then we just get resentful because we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do, right? And that can feel like devaluation to them. And then eventually we leave. That's discardment. So I don't know. There's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to love bomb a person. But it all comes back to a lack of self-awareness, right? And I think really toxic love bombers, if it is Max in the Max and Demi scenario, and you know we see this like... And a lot of people, they are toxic and fairly calculated people. If they're psychopaths, sociopaths, narcissists, like this is not ultra accidental, right? For some of us, it might be, but the outcome is still the same. It hurts the other person. So it's important for us to pull back and be like, okay, why, why am I booking first class flights for this guy that I've known for three weeks? Why am I doing this? I've talked to you before about how I get charity puppy. I get this like puppyish mania about plugging into people or things or helping people. 
Maybe that's love bombing. I don't know. I should book some more therapy. But let's talk about discardment. Discardment has a few different uses. And it happens for a few different reasons. One, the love bomber might see the victim is no longer kind of like shiny and new. It's like, ugh, well, she's fat now. She's broke now. I've spent all our money. She's fucking useless to me. I'm going to trade up, right? It could be that they're using this as a manipulation technique technique to get you to plug back in because sometimes hopefully the victim is like wait a minute I'm going out with my friends I'm going out with my friends thank you and so the bomber has to step it up just devaluing them and saying well you're a bitch if you go out and no what do you think no one's gonna love you like me or think your friends know you I know you I love you they don't love you look at everything I do for you so they've got up the ante if you push back and call their bluff they're like all right fine I'm leaving and then they ghost. And you're like, <gasps> and you've just been taught not to stand up for yourself. You've been taught that your desires are going, and not your desires, your, your healthy, normal boundaries are going to cost you love. It's not love, it's manipulation. And it should cost you that. Your boundaries should push people away. Fences should keep people out. That's the point. Fences should keep people out. That's the point. Good, good job, fence. And sometimes those fences are electrified. And if you touch it, and if I told you it was electric, decisions have consequences, don't they? But another reason a love bomber could do this is to just keep the game going. Just to further manipulate you, find out exactly where that fence line is. No matter which way you slice it, the discardment is not good. And like I said, this cycle can repeat again, again, and again, and again, and again. We all know couples, You've all probably been in a relationship where you fight, you make up, you break up, you fight. Like the whole thing just goes again and again. And when you get back together, it's, I love you and you're my, you're my wife and I love you and I never want to leave you again until there's a boundary set back, until you push back, until there's something else that they want from you. And then it's the devaluation and then it's the discardment. But this all comes back to knowing yourself, no matter which side of this you're on. Because like I said, sometimes... We can be the bombers too, which is like horrifying. It is horrifying to think that maybe you're spraying this kind of unhealthiness out into the world inadvertently because you're not aware of what you're, what is going on in your mind, in your heart and what you need. And maybe what's going on in your ego, your sense of identity, your sense of self. And conversely, if you find yourself constantly the victim of love bombing, what is that hold inside? Ah, ah. Who wants to look at the hole? Who wants to look at the hole? But if you don't look at the hole, guess what? A love bomber is always going to be looking at it. Talks to people are all, I have to say, stop saying look at the hole. I'm so sorry, the stars. If you don't pull out your psychological splinter, they're going to press on it, right? It's better, metaphor. that's better. They're going to keep pressing on it and you are going to be a constant, relentless risk for predators. Wouldn't it be easier to just figure out what's going on? It's going to suck. It's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be a little painful, but it is not actually a bottomless pit. It isn't. To address your issues and traumas and face things, we think we're just going to fall into it and we're going to start to cry and we're never going to stop. We're going to drown in our own tears. But it's not like that. It, I use the example of a splinter for a very specific reason. Because when you have a splinter, it's like, I can't get it out. No, I can't. It's going to hurt forever. They're going to have to amputate. But really, you, you do a little digging and it hurts, but, but you do pull it out. And the second you pull it out, you feel better. And the second you pull it out, healing begins. And you're on your way. You leave it in there. Festers, it gets worse and it gets worse. And yeah, maybe they have to chop your hand off. I don't know. I'm sure it's happened. I want to know what you guys have to say about love bombing. If you're being honest, have you been a love bomber? What motivated it? You know, and I, I know that no one here is motivated by anything sinister. It's not evil week yet. So what do you think was precipitating that? You know, tell me about it. What do you think is going on with Max and Demi? Do you think they'll get back together? Ugh, I hope not. Who do you think was at fault? Do you think it could have been possible that maybe Demi was a little bit to blame? For more, click like and subscribe. Like I said, follow me on Instagram. I will see you later, Shalligators. Mwah!